Okay, hi everyone. This is Rachel from Mina SNR, and today we have a real treat. We have a scholar who is not only going to tell us about his work and how he got to it and all the fascinating, fascinating things he's found, but he's also a member of our steering committee. Uh, we have Alper with us today. Alper, as is my tradition, I'm going to ask you to please introduce yourself as I am notoriously terrible at giving introductions. So uh, we're really looking forward to hearing more about you today, why you chose to study what you study, how you chose to study what you study, what, what life path brought you there, why it's important, maybe any advice you have to offer other researchers out there. But uh, so there's a lot to cover in the discussion yeah. ahead. So, you know, you can start wherever you want to start, but maybe first just tell us a little bit who you are, where okay. you are. Okay, okay. Things along those lines. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, um, I'm Ad Perigiri. Uh, so right now I am a sociologist of science, uh, but I started my career uh, in political, uh, political science. And then uh, I studied political science like 10 years. And then when I was an exchange student at uh, Amsterdam, uh, I, I took some courses uh, from sociology and anthropology departments. And then I said, wow, this is the way I should go. I should continue my career in. And then... Um, Wait, I'm sorry to stop you already, but can you tell us a little bit more about that moment? What was it about sociology and anthropology that gave you that, you know, feeling that this is something that was calling your name as opposed to the political science that you had been uh, pursuing until then? I don't know, just curi my curiosity getting the better of me. And oh, that's, a, that's a fair question. Um, actually, I think... Uh... What fascinated me about sociology is that it's more about the fundamentals. So politics is a kind of a reflection of that fundamentals. You know, there are certain things in society that do not change or change slowly. So I was familiar with sociology, of course, when I was studying political science. Uh, but for example, when I read uh, Putnam uh, and his study on Italy, so he dis, uh, he compares a northern and so southern parts of Italy, and then says that uh, we have same institutions here, we have uh, same laws uh, here, but the the things work very differently in the northern and southern parts of Italy. That should be about something else. So uh, that should be about, for example, the uh, the uh, another kind of capital that we are not really referring to. Uh, which is called social capital, for example. Uh, so uh, when I read things like this, I have this idea that uh, we're putting too much emphasis on political science, on institutions, uh, but we're not really thinking about uh, the real tenets behind it, uh, the real uh, you know, uh, factors uh, behind it. So sociology gave me that perspective and I was studying uh, anti-system parties uh, when before, ju just before quitting studying political science. And then I saw that that's too much detail and I don't want to, I'm not really interested in that kind of detail. Uh, besides, I was interested in uh, natural sciences and then sociology, seems like a great place to study so, uh, natural sciences to me because you know um well as a turk uh, this is this might be more interesting for us uh but the idea here is that um so we in our culture natural sciences are glorified and it's like it's almost sacred and in some instances it's more sacred than the sacred so um Thinking about how society and how social factors or psychological factors have an impact on uh, the natural sciences uh, was a great interest. So it was surprising to learn that, oh, wait, natural sciences doesn't have to be that objective. And when you read history of science, you see that uh, people are influenced by their culture, by their gender, by their political stance. 
uh, when they evaluate scientific facts. So it also uh, increased my interest in sociology. Uh, and then I decided to quit my PhD, uh, which was, uh, you know, I, 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 well, that was a hard decision to take because you spent three years for a PhD and then you suddenly say, I will study anyone uh, because, you know, uh, there was other pressures. We're not just academics. Um, and then I studied anyone. And this time I knew what I was going to study. So I decided to study uh, sociology of science. And uh, that was my first, uh, you know, important career change. And then in 2014, uh, I visit uh, Leeds, University of Leeds uh, for postdoc. And then there I had a chance to study with uh, Greg Reddick and John Topham. And those guys uh, were, I really admire their work. Uh, Greg Reddick, for example, was the editor of uh, Cambridge Companion to Darwin. Um, so my what, what I see is that in order to be a good sociologist, you have to be a good historian. So you need to read history a lot, as you know. So I started reading history, uh, history of sciences, and then what I see is that I think I love history more than I love uh, sociology. So this time I didn't quit sociology, but uh, I also spent uh, so much time on reading about history of science. Um, so my latest publications since then uh, are most focused on history of science. And I publish in uh, history of science journals. And my books also have uh, that, you know, as the focus. Uh, yeah, that's basically my career. So yeah. how would you explain again this shift from sociology to history? I mean, you didn't give us, I don't think, the detail yet on what your PhD, your postdoc, your topics have been after in history and things like that. But uh... Well, as I said, I mean, if you look at uh, sociologists, um, Marx, Weber, uh, Durkheim, they're all great historians as well. Because, uh, you know, in sociology, we have a limited uh, sample and you need to go back in history and try to find cases from there and then utilize them. So um, that was one reason, but in my case, um let me put it this way in turkey again um history of science is very fundamental because the role attached to science is quite crucial and it's not just about discovering nature or using it uh, in order to develop some technology uh, it has this symbolic meaning it's like a compass, it's like a, the real guide or the sole guide in uh, humanity is to show you the right path and the rest is just meaningless. So I don't want to sound anachronistic, but um, it's like the scientism today, you know, especially in the late 19th century, Ottoman intellectuals, many of them, not all, uh, were thinking that only science can solve our problems. So they read history, they read Western history, and then they concluded that uh, we need to have a, a similar fight in our society. So they are mostly French readers. They, they were reading in French and they were interested in uh, French history. And then there's this, you know, in, in France, there's a clash in the Ancien Regime. So the uh, enlightenment, and then uh, there's this dark forces of religion and tradition, you know, that kind of a narrative. And they also, uh, they, they bought that narrative, and then they try to implement it in the Turkish case. Although the story is quite different in the Turkish case, because we didn't have a church-like organization. Uh, Ottoman Empire was not a theocracy in that sense. So the, the ruler is, uh, has the real authority over religious institutions. Anyways, this is too much detail. But um, so I think uh, 
that was important for the late Ottoman intellectuals. Also, it was important for early uh, Republican elites, which were, by the way, some were the same people. So those became important figures in the early days of Republic, and then they wrote uh, books, sociology books, history books, uh, which were shaped by that uh, religion versus science uh, mentality. So um, in the Turkish uh, history, in the last two centuries, we see that kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the image of science is like the, uh, it, it gained this sacred status and it gained it for many people uh, at the expense of religion, right? So uh, science is becoming uh, the, the guide, which means the old guide, which used to be religion, should be left alone. I mean, people should not be religious anymore. You know, that kind of mentality was dominant for at least for some uh, elites in the last two centuries. So I was interested in history uh, in that sense as well, because history is shaping, you know, this is uh, recent history and it shapes our uh, books. Therefore, it shapes our education, it shapes our uh, society. So, you know, you, you need to know what happened uh, in the last two centuries to understand uh, Turkey today. Even the recent elections have something to do with that. So therefore, if you're writing about uh, sociology of science in Turkey, you need to read about what happened uh, in Turkish history. Also, what happened in the Western history, because Turkish history is uh, fundamentally shaped by Western discussions as well. Yeah, so that's the uh, brief answer to your question. In my uh, postdoc, I studied, uh, well, I wrote two articles uh, during my postdoc. Uh, one is published in the British Journal for the History of Science. Uh, it was about an Ottoman intellectual, Ismail Fenne Ertuğrul. And then Ismail Fenne Ertuğrul was uh, uh, late Ottoman intellectual, and then he believed that uh, the theory of evolution was wrong, but he also stated that uh, in order to prove it wrong, we need to use philosophy, we need to use sciences, we can't just refer to our sacred texts. So in that way, he's, uh, uh, I mean, the way he thinks was quite Western. Right, and he refers to Western resources to question the validity of uh, Darwinism, and then he also said um, there is nothing fundamentally wrong about Darwinism in terms of Islam. So he also stated that as a religious person, I don't agree with this theory because it's not scientific. But he also said um, there is nothing anti. Islam about this theory. And then he dwells in Quran and other sources and try to show that those verses could be interpreted in, uh, in this way as well. So there's no problem. And then uh, thirdly, he also said that um, evolutionary theory, although was not a problem in terms of Islam, it could uh, blur the distinction between man and the animals, the animal kingdom. And therefore, could lead to uh, you know disasters like uh, wars, and could uh, you know affect people's lives. So um, this is a very sophisticated uh, and nuanced view on evolution at the time, at least. And then he also said, if our knowledge changes, uh, Muslims should be ready to interpret Quran in that way. Sure. So he wasn't an uh, in a way, he's more open-minded than many uh, Muslim intellectuals of today. And then, um, so it was a very good article, I think, because the topic uh, was interesting, because most of the time uh, we just focus on extremes 
uh, when I say extremes, I'm not saying there are just a few people like that, of course, but so we either focus on um, materialist Ottoman thinkers, and then we say, okay, and then there's this reaction, fundamentalist, uh, how should I put it, religious camp, which is against, you know, scientific views like evolution. And then you, you also have people like Ismail Fendi who respect science, who believes science is very important, and who was also critical of uh, materialists. So uh, there are people like that, and I, I wanted to show that. And the second article I wrote uh, during my uh, postdoc was, this time I look at Darwin's views on Ottomans. So in the, in the uh, Turkish anti-evolutionist camp, people are using Darwin's uh, views against Turks, which was, of course, negative because he was a Victorian. And for many Victorians, uh, they were not very, uh, you know, sympathetic old Turks at the time. And he was a standard Victorian in that sense. Uh, but people read too much into it, and then some even argued that Darwin uh, was working for uh, British state, uh, British government, and they have this secret, uh, you know, agreement, so that Darwin would come with this theory, and then he would say, "You can also apply this to human worlds." And then so that we can use it and we can legitimize our, uh, you know, conquer of the Ottoman land, you know, that kind of theory. By the way, of course, some um, colonizers uh, use Darwin's theory to legitimize their position. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but it's like people, I mean, being used by something is different than being a partner of it, right? So they are like, uh, Darwin is, was a secret agent of uh, those colonizers. So I tried to show that this was the standard opinion at the time among Victorians. And then I also showed, tried to show that uh, I look at Darwin's library and I tried to find and search every book that may have a reference to Turks in those books so that I make sure that what Darwin gained his views, uh, the, the sources Darwin shaped his views uh, by are uh, explained in my paper so that, uh, you know, he doesn't have a secret agenda. That was the normal thing for a Victorian to do. And then, um, yeah, so a few years ago, this time I read, I wrote another paper, again, for British Journal for the Sur Science this time. This is about Turkish, uh, how should I put it? Uh, how Turkish historians uh, explain science uh, in the Islamic world. So uh, in a way, it's a meta-historical uh, article. And then how they used history to, le to legitimize uh, certain uh, positions, to defend certain positions or to support certain positions. Like for example, uh, the Turkish materialists are reading history from a different perspective. Turkish Islamists are reading history, history of science from a different perspective. And then, so I wrote the history of their history uh, their understanding of history and how it also affects today's discussions. For example, today, uh, even the museums created by certain uh, institutions are shaped by these changes. I mean, the government changes, and then you started to focus on pre-Islamic era and then try to find links. And then, or you may say that, so this is very interesting because, you know, in the pre-Islamic history of Turks, we don't know man, many things about it. It's, at least we don't know what they think about science. Uh, so, for example, some secular Turks uh, try to find solution by saying that, you know what, uh, it was the Turkish Muslims who were more influential in bringing uh, this Islamic golden age into life. 
So in a way, it's again a Turkish accomplishment. Um, so uh, I try to uh, understand how history of science could be used for uh, championing certain ideologies uh, in that paper. And I have some books uh, written again in those lines. Um, some were popular uh, in, of course, in this field. Uh, for example, like if you if your books are sold more than I don't know five thousand copies uh, in Turkey in a history of science uh, genre, you would say that's a popular one. Um, and another thing I try to do is I don't want to limit my discussions, uh, so. I don't want them to be uh, a discussions only among academics. I want the larger public to learn about those as well. So um, I try to talk on national TV channels and I don't know, sometimes give interviews to Turkish uh, dailies. Sometimes I write uh, pieces, uh, opinion pieces to Turkish dailies, uh, daily newspapers. So that's I think the way I try to share my knowledge uh, with the larger public about those issues. That's me in a nutshell. <laughs> wow, well, that's a lot. I mean, you bring together so many important strands of these fields of inquiry, having both uh, the historical basis, the sociological uh, perspective, and the interest in politics. So yeah, I am kind of interested a little bit if uh, we've already made it to the present now. So, and I know you have both facets of your work that you're in the academy, you're teaching as a, uh, you're teaching sociology to, to students, and you're also in the public uh, sphere. So I'm just sort of curious about the difference what are you encountering or first of all what's important for you to give over in these different uh areas where you work and sort of what are the different challenges or pushback that you find in both places or what are the what are the key issues right now and and how are you engaging with them i guess is sort of my question well i think the biggest challenge i face is the practical one i don't have much time to do anything else uh, because I'm teaching so many lectures, uh, so many courses, uh, which is really hard to do anything else. So I have a friend who is working in finance and sometimes he asks me, did you read this, uh, the, this book? Uh, it's just published. I'm like, no, it's in my list, but I don't have time to read it. And then he already read it. And I'm so sometimes I question myself because I'm doing this job to read more, to write more. And then I see my friend in finance has more time to read it. Uh, well, that's sad. And I don't know how to solve this practical problem, but that's a very important one. Just today, my editor uh, is forcing me to finish my new book. And then uh, I say, you know, I don't have much time to do that because we also do some, you know, for example, yesterday we had this uh, big organization in Istanbul. Uh, Richard Swinburne was here, Rodney Holder uh, of Faraday Institute was here. Uh, so we try to um, organize other activities to, again, reach the larger public who are interested in those topics as well. Uh, so that's the the biggest problem, practical uh, reasons. Um, and secondly, um, yeah, of course, Turkey is very polarized. Uh, the, the polarization in Turkey is quite uh, strong. Therefore, people could be very emotional when you're saying something they don't like. And sometimes it's safe to just uh, choose one side in a discussion. I'm sure you have a similar problem in Israel, uh, personally. Sometimes it's safe and you know uh, comfortable to choose one over the other. But you're like, as a social scientist, you have to say, you know, you have to be nuanced. And then you say, yes, what he said 
is wrong, but you know, this part is right. When you say things like that, people are like, oh, now you're defending him. You're like, no, 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 I'm not defending him. I think he's wrong, but this was, you know. So people are not, uh, many people, not all, of course. Uh, people could be emotional and critical of what you say instead of trying to consider whether you're right or wrong. Of course, you can be wrong. Uh, maybe, maybe it's black and white. Maybe it's not nuanced. Uh, but the way they evaluate your opinions are not uh, uh, complicated. It's just uh, they just look at it and then try to place you in one camp, <clears throat> which is quite um, you know problematic for a social scientist. Uh, of course, the institutions are uh, sensitive about those issues as well. I mean, you say something and then someone is uh, being critical of you and then the, the institution you're working for is becoming more, uh, I don't know, uh, they are like, um, maybe you shouldn't talk about this anymore, you know? Or maybe they, they don't say it out loud, but you feel, you feel that they are not happy about it. So there's another problem uh, to be living in a uh such a polarized society um and i think other than that there are of course financial problems as you can guess uh books are expensive articles are expensive uh trying to attend conferences are expensive so and turkish economy is not uh in the heyday of <laughs> It's history, so uh, we have some problems, economic problems, which is reflected on academics as well. Yeah, those are the problems. Of course, there are problems about, again, uh, sometimes uh, students may not be about, happy about what you're teaching. Uh, but I don't really care about that part of the question because, um, I mean, they are students for a reason they are there to learn uh even if this is what i say to my students you don't have to agree with what me or what your other professors say what you need to do is try to understand try to if you're going to criticize still you need to understand it um even if you are graduated with the in the same position uh in the same place in the same stance political stance you need to be more sophisticated compared to like four years ago right this is what i say and most of the time what i see is that uh they are changing a lot in time uh they are becoming more and more uh you know nuanced and sophisticated and they they are more open to listen to what others say even if they don't agree with it at all yeah these are the problems <laughs> Well, that's the rewarding part of teaching and being being involved in higher education. So what is your new book about that your editor is uh, nudging you about? Actually, it's not a new book. It's, oh. uh, it's an old book with a new edition. Uh, but in a way, it's a new book because I'm putting too much uh, energy in it to revise it. And this is going to be published in a new uh, publisher by a new publisher. Therefore, uh, and the uh, the cover is going to change. The sources are going to be added. So it's it it takes too much energy and time to do all these things. Therefore, it feels like a new book, uh, but it's not a new one. Uh, so it's called "What Science Is Not," and it's a critical evaluation of the new atheism uh, through a. Turkish uh, through an, the analysis of a Turkish uh, new atheist, uh, which is a great scientist. Uh, he's a great geologist. This guy is uh, very successful in the international arena as well. But when he talks about religion, history, and politics, uh, he's becoming a, a, how should I put it? A disappointment. Uh, at least I can put it that way, I think. Uh, so I was being critical of his views about science, uh, not his views 
about his field, of course, but the way he, um, how should I put it? The way he understands science, the role he uh, attaches to science, you know, and again, the way he uh, tries to uh, clash science with religion. So I'm critical of those uh, positions, which is a typical New Atheist in that sense. Uh, yeah, and it's, uh, that was the most popular uh, book I've ever uh, written. People uh, like it. And I every day I have emails saying that we're waiting for that book. Uh, so unless someone is trolling me, uh, it's going to be uh, a good success, I hope. Well, great. Probably people want you to do debates and all of those things. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a very debate guy, by the way. I don't, I mean, I write because, you know, I think debates are, uh, the demagogues are good in debates, right? Uh, but writing is different. It's slow. You read it, you digest it, you try to understand it, and then you look at the other side. So it's more balance and i think more healthy but the other one is about demagogues for example let's assume that i don't have any social fears but you have social fears but your arguments are stronger and then i mean i find this uh point that will make you angry or i don't know shy then i talk about it i talk about it so it's good for demagogues uh but uh, yeah sometimes i'm being in uh those kind of uh, you know debates on TVs, but that's not really something I like. Not because I'm a bad demagogue, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy to hear about any other particular points in your work that you'd like to share, or anything else that you think that's important for either new researchers coming into the field, um, thoughts you have for them, advice from your own experience and work, or whatever you think would be a great place to bring uh, the conversation now. Well, I think um, the cliches are so strong uh, about science and religion. So no matter what we write, uh, we need more. So we need more uh, analysis, which shows that uh, the picture is more complicated. It's not that simple. This is an ideological, uh, you know, reading of history and it's not healthy it's not helping anything i mean we just saw that uh during covid 19 or the last uh you know a few months ago we had this earthquake terrible earthquake in turkey um what we see is that we need science uh and we need science a lot so science is helpful um Therefore, uh, trying to create, and science needs allies. This is what I say in one of my uh, interviews on a Turkish daily. So science is about, uh, science needs allies, doesn't need uh, publicated enemies like religion. So if you want to persuade people about uh, vaccine, you need religious authorities as well, right? Because religious authorities can persuade people about having that vaccine, for example. So uh, we need allies. And we don't need fabricated enemies. This is one thing. And Elaine Eklund writes about those issues a lot. And she also emphasizes this point by creating a false dichotomy between science and religion, you're not helping. If you really like science, if you really like uh, people uh, hear what science says, uh, you need to uh, look at the important institutions in the society and how you can use them to make people listen to science. And religion is, in many societies, is the most important institution that can help you. Of course, the first reason I'm critical of this clash uh, or the, the idea that science and religion are enemies by nature kind of thinking is that it's not true. 
And I mean, when you look at history of science, uh, yes, there are certain periods of time, science, uh, religious authorities have problems with what scientists said. Uh, but when you look into details, most of the time politics is there. Uh, so, and also you see certain periods, and this is the majority of the time, I think, uh, religious institutions and authorities uh, are not uh, against science. On the opposite, uh, on the contrary, what you see is that sometimes um people in the history of humanity uh when you think about for example natural theology there are periods uh people see scientific knowledge as a source that can contribute to their knowledge about god and religion uh like newton for example when i read his book uh titled optics you know it's one of the most important books of history of science and then in that book He's talking about very technical questions. And at the end, he says, you know, uh, by learning about all these, we can be good, uh, you know, people like Noah and his sons. So we become uh, good uh, people in the eyes of God as well. So he took all that technical information and then said, and related to religious, uh, you know, behavior. Uh, being a good uh, person and then um, in the eyes of God, you know, so it's a it's a uh, it's a big tradition in the Western history, and then I also would like to show that reading uh, the the Dawkinsian reading of history of science is not true. It's not true. It's not helping. So therefore. Uh, we need to write more about those topics. So we need new uh, young generations to uh, persuade careers in this field. And I think the best way to help them is to write good articles and books so that set a good example. And then uh, that's what we're trying to do. So if people want to find more of your work and find follow more of what you're doing, what's the best way for them to uh, to get the information? I think academia is the best way to follow my work. Uh, academia accounts, uh, and I'm using it actively. And then I also use Twitter. Uh, so they can also find me there. Um, yeah, those are the sources, two sources, they, they can learn about the updates. There is also alperbigili.com, but uh, that's mainly in Turkish. So uh, for Turkish followers, they can also follow my uh, web page. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Alper, very much for giving us, first of all, the overview on on <laughs> your, your career, your trajectory, and how you got into all of these uh these different disciplines which make our field so interdisciplinary, the history, philosophy, sociology, anthropology of science. Um, it sounds like it's been an exciting life so far. So uh, <laughs> looking forward to see where, where life continues to take you. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add or if we should just sign off or. Yeah, I started uh, playing drums uh, a few months ago, so. Uh... <laughs> for a new career change <laughs> music is in the future yeah why not <laughs> you can upload a, a video to academia.edu of the uh, <laughs> the drama on, side on of. youtube probably yeah i will do <laughs> okay well thank you very much for your time today thanks for having me Lord. take care bye